It was 1.30 on a Monday afternoon, mid-May. The sun was trying to shine. It wasn't cold, but it wasn't warm. I sat beside my large wooden desk, staring blankly at my collection of framed photos of my heroes, detectives from the world of film and TV, mostly TV. Next to Bogart sat Holmes and Mitchum in Out of Time, Bergerac, Hazel, David Yip in The Chinese Detective. These men had been like gods to me. I was zoning out, trying to take my mind off of my hangover and the report I had to write up about an unsuccessful missing persons case. Jobs were slow coming in at the moment. Times were tough. I was using the office as a crash pad, sleeping on my old Chesterfield and using the local leisure centre to shower when I arose each day. I had been kicked out of my flat due to non-payment of rent. Now I was hanging in here. Luckily, the landlord of this place happens to be more understanding of my sporadic payments of rent. The need for a drink was starting to occupy my every thought. I had to fight it off. The urge to take that office bottle of scotch from the drawer and take that first nip of the day. Suddenly a knock on the door broke my train of thought. In stepped an old lady. Hello, Mr. O'Connell, I presume, she spoke in a well-cultivated English upper-class accent. I replied, that's right, Mr. O'Connell, at your service, madam. She told me her name, that being Miss Dottie Vibert, and how she had bumped into a friend in a West End pub who had advised her to seek out my services regarding a dilemma she had found herself in. I listened and looked at her. I could tell straight away that she was a wealthy, world-wise dame more than she was letting on. She looked like she liked a drink. I would think a bottle of gin a day whilst munching quaaludes and cream cakes, sitting back watching slow television on the Yesterday TV channel. She told me she didn't think there could have been much call for a private detective in this day and age, and inquired as to what exactly my services entailed. I answered, I find missing people, people who have disappeared, people who don't want to be found, the living presumed dead, runaways, swindlers, bigamists, lost pets. I investigate unfaithful partners. I do surveillance and counter surveillance. I find out who's been putting their hands in the tills. I find information to see if people are who and what they claim to be and lots lots more besides that I can't divulge to you right now. I hope you understand. Confidential you know. How jolly exciting she exclaimed. A real life private eye. Just what I am looking for. She went on to explain her situation. She told me of her late husband George, who had been a very successful businessman and had had lots of dealings with a group of trust fund financiers on the Channel Island of Jersey, most of which happened to involve a series of offshore bank accounts, which sounded shadowy to say the least. She told me her dear late husband George had passed away a couple of years back and that she had been trying since then to find the whereabouts of some documents. She believed these to be in the possession of some of his old associates who still lived on Jersey. To access one of these accounts, she told me that she needed to obtain some passwords from two men going by the names of Cyril Lesueur and Graham Leherge, former business partners of her late husband. She informed me that each time she had tried to obtain said passwords, she had come up against a brick wall. According to her, Lesueur had gone missing whilst Leherge ignored all correspondence, or had simply been rude on the telephone. She had tried legal action, but it seemed that they were outside of English legal jurisdiction. She wondered if I would be interested in taking on the case and tracking these two men down on her behalf, requesting that I travel to Jersey in order to retrieve said codes. I told her I was interested. God knows I needed the money. I told her my fees and expenses, that I wanted her to book me a plane ticket and a hotel in Jersey and that I would fly out there next Tuesday. I hiked the price up a bit, as it was clear that money wasn't really an issue. I told her I needed as much information as she could give me on the men she had talked about. Names, dates of birth, home addresses, photos. I leaned back on my chair, looked up at the framed photo of Jim Bergerac, winked at him, and I sat back and contemplated my new assignment. The plane landed, I walked through customs, and before I knew it, I was stopped and interrogated by two well-educated chaps from Her Majesty's Customs and Excise. Soon they were ushering me into a small room, and soon they searched me. And soon I started to get all upset about this and started to kick up a fuss. 
They told me they're just doing their job and that it was under an anti-terrorist act that they had the right to stop and search me. And not soon enough did I find myself free to go, but only after having had to have answered a ton of questions. I left the customs men in the arrivals lounge and made my way to the outside of the airport. I lit up a smoke and tried to relax after my welcoming party to the island. I sucked on the fag and exhaled a great plume of smoke and stress. I walked over to the taxi rank and was met by a man in a flat cap who said he was a minicab driver. He said he'd give me a cheaper fare than the boys on the rank, so we made over to the car and stepped inside. I sat in the back seat of the car and relaxed. I could see the taxi driver looking at me in the rearview mirror. I could sense that he was about to start asking me 50 different questions, so I eased back and waited for the onslaught to commence. So you're over here on holidays then? Yes. So you're from the mainland then, hey? Yes. What part are you from then, hey? London. You're not English, are you? I mean, you're not fully English, you're uh, mixed or whatever they call it. My dad's Irish and my mother's Algerian. Oh, I see, fair play to you. What are you over in Jersey for? To find a one-eyed man. No, I don't care much for London, or the mainland for that matter. It's gone to the dogs, if you ask me. No, give me Jersey any day. It's safe here. A good way of life. I mean, too much crime and problems on the mainland. Just have to see that by reading the Daily Mail. Each day I read it, and I think, no, thank you. Blow all that goings on over there. I'm quite happy here, thank you very much. Me and the missus like to go to France on our holidays. Well, I tell you, you see that house over there on the right, the big one? That's owned by Bradley Lefevre. I went to school with his cousin, Kenneth. Good fellow. Died a few years back. Cancer. He had a good send-off at the crematorium. I think his brother used to run a pub in St. Helier. Which one was it now? The Red Light. No, the Wharf. No, that was it. The Great Exeter pub it was. I think it's a coffee shop now. By this point, I was trying to block out the strange stream of consciousness that the driver was spewing out. I just sat back and looked out of the window. There seemed to be a hell of a lot of traffic on the road for such a small place. And we seemed to be caught in the middle of it, adding to the length of this tedious monologue. When we arrived at the hotel, I felt that I had known the driver my whole life. I knew who his next door neighbor's kids had married, and the list of births and deaths in the island for the last 40 years. I awoke with the slight glimmers of a mild hangover. The seagulls had been squawking since daybreak. I took a shower, had a shave, splashed on a bit of Old Spice, then took in the hotel's breakfast. Next, I headed towards downtown St. Helia via a car park named Snow Hill. It seemed to be a route cut between two sections of great rock, one side of which seemed to house an old fort. There seemed to be vibrations of a past glory in this place that was now just a car park. I passed through a motorbike parking area. It had a dark and shadowy resonance, the sort of past that had seen a lot of late night casual violence. I imagined the early 80s and this place being the favored hangout of gangs of local boot boys lurking in the shadows, intoxicated and waiting for some unsuspecting passers-by to harangue and stick the boot in. I quickly passed through this portal of past hates and walked down some steps. I ascended a slight slope and was on one of the main shopping streets of St. Helia. It was called Queen Street. I walked down it. This street had seen better days. It was like any other town center in the UK. It did not impress me. I walked on till I came to a junction and crossed the road. This led on to the other main street, King Street. I wandered down King Street, then arrived in the Royal Square. It had a real French feel about it. On one side of the square was a large official building. That was the home of the local government, where inside the politicians would pass new laws to make the island more attractive to tax-dodging businesses. I was then attracted by a granite V in the center of the square. I walked over and connected with it. It gave off an aura of past defiance. I then made my way over to a bench and quizzed some locals. I asked if they knew Cyril Le Soeur and where he could be found. I told them he had gone missing 
and was perhaps destitute. They told me to try the Parade Park, a favoured hangout of destitutes. I had noticed that since arriving on the island they still had pound notes. I went into a bank and changed the tenor into pound notes. Outside the bank I looked at the wad of ones. I felt rich. I imagined they were dollars and I was Mike Hammer, back in the good old days of make-believe pulp. I made my way towards the park, coming to a granite cross at the end of the main shopping street. This was called Charing Cross, very different to the one back in London. I walked on and soon came to a giant toad sitting on a plinth of polished granite. It was odd and a bit scary. I walked on. All of the lights of the town seemed to be pulsating with surges of strange energy. I walked on through the park. In the middle of the park was a giant granite monument. On a bench below sat a local street drinker, sucking on a can of super strength lager. I decided to stop a little bit away from him. I knew a way to get him to come to me. I took a straight from my deck and lit up and enjoyed a smoke. About a minute later I could see the park bench aristocrat on his feet walking towards me. I learned a long time ago that lighting up a cigarette was like turning on a neon sign above your head that says I've got cigarettes, that your average down and out has second sight and can see the glowing end of a freshly lit cigarette from a quarter of a mile away and can also read the neon sign that to their eyes says you've got cigarettes and you would like to give me one of them. The man was a scruffy fellow who could have been any age from 25 to 35. It was hard to tell, he was weathered. He took a drag and then asked if I could spare him a pound towards a drink. I took out my bankroll of one pound notes and gave him one. He stared at them and then asked if he could have another. I said I was happy to give him one more if he gave me some information. He agreed to help. I asked him did he know of a Cyril Le Soeur, a one-eyed vagrant. He said he didn't, but that one of the old timers might well know. He smiled and took the other note and of course asked for another one. I gave him another, God loves a trier I thought to myself, and watched him shuffle back over to the bench. I liked the tree in the middle of the park, so I went over and soaked up its ambience. I was suddenly joined by what I presumed was a local tramp looking for money. I gave him a pound. He put it in his mouth, then spat it out. Then delivered these words to me. A man that is born falls into a dream like a man falls into the sea. If he tries to climb out into the air as inexperienced people endeavor to do, he drowns. He freaked me out to my very core. I decided to get as far away from him as I could, so I made my way towards the town centre. I headed towards the town's central market. I passed a carpet shop and was suddenly met with a surge of cosmic interference. Punks, poppers and the Illuminati flashed in and out of my head. I walked on. I came to a pulsating off-license and bought myself a small bottle of whiskey. 
and decided to enjoy a nip. I walked on. I spent the rest of the afternoon in a number of St. Helier's back street boozers. I made contact with Laherge on one of the pub payphones. He was polite to begin with, but then I told him I was working for Dottie Vibert and asked whether he had any information regarding offshore bank account codes. He began to cuss and swear down the phone. It aroused my suspicions. He said, I am Detective Sergeant Alan LeMaitre of the CID Department of the States of Jersey Police. This is Detective Constable Dave Garnett. And you are Cormac O'Connell of Number 20 Denmark Street, W1, London. Over here to poke your nose into business that does not concern you. If I had it my way, you would be off this island straight away. But as you haven't broken any laws of yet, I have to play it by the book. So why have you picked me up and taken me in your car? You can't do that, I said. He said, you accepted my offer. I didn't force you, and we should be only too pleased to drop you off at any time, once we have laid down a few ground rules. We are doing very nicely, thank you, without the likes of you coming over here and poking around in other people's business, making nuisance calls to Mr. Laherge. You will not do that again, do you hear? And if you had any sense, you would get your ass back to the mainland. We run a tight ship over here. We protect and serve the interests of the Jersey residents. We deliver a very high standard of law and order. So do you know Cyril the Swer, or where I could find him? I said. He said, I've never heard of this man. I don't know who you mean. Dave, pull over, and let's drop Mr. O'Connell off here. We are watching you, O'Connell, LeMaitre shouted from the car as it sped off. They had dropped me on a hill above the harbour. I was right near the power station chimney, so I knew I wasn't far from the hotel. I knew from Alan's reaction that I had hit a nerve with the mention of Cyril. This was getting interesting. I would go for a think in my hotel room. I took out my small bottle of whiskey and took a few nips and wandered back to the hotel. The bus drops me off at a car park in St. Juan's. I make a call to La Herge. Once he realizes it's me, he goes mad and puts the phone down. The bus dropped me off at Leyland, a scrubland that overlooked St. Juan's Bay. I wandered around until I came to a bunker that I could enter. These relics of the occupation resonated with a sinister vibe that I couldn't quite put my finger on. Some of the walls were adorned with graffiti, names of persons who had spent time hanging out in them, and band names. I imagined groups of youths huddled around drinking or doing solvents hiding out away from the all-seeing Jersey society. To think a man would end up living in one of these places. It must not do one's soul any good. In the bunker was a strange chalk symbol of an eye.
I was picking something up from it, but what, I wasn't sure. I left the bunker and exited this area. Last night as I dreamt, I found myself walking through a desert-esque environment. I was searching for something. What, I was as of yet unsure. I entered La Hug B. There was a strange vibe about the place. There was a chapel on top of a 40-foot mound. I wandered around the mound and came to the entrance of a Neolithic burial chamber. I crouched down and entered into the chamber. As in the bunkers the day before, I was getting strange vibes from this place. It was a feeling that I didn't get in my day-to-day -day life and I didn't like it. I didn't hang around and left who or what spirit had been hanging out in there for the last couple of millennium alone. It was not best pleased that people were fucking up its ambience. I decided to take a look at the chapel on the mount. Once I was on top of the hill, I was joined by a young lady who introduced herself. Hello, I am Georgina. I work for the Heritage Trust. Do you want me to tell you the history of this place? She asked. Why, I guess I could do with learning something today, I said. 
Well, in the Dark Ages, when there was a great marsh in the parish of St. Lawrence, a dragon lived there wallowing in the mud and breathing out destructive bursts of fire. The news of this devastation it was causing in Jersey, where nobody could deal with it, eventually reached Normandy and the ears of the Seigneur of Hamby, a Norman knight. After saying farewell to his loving wife, Hamby set sail from Normandy with his faithful squire Francis to see if he could deliver Jersey from its terrible scourge. After a great fight, and with one final thrust from his mighty sword, the knight did slay the dragon and did cut its head off to prove victory. Then, tired from exertions on behalf of the islanders, he decided to lie down and take a rest before setting sail for Normandy and his beloved wife. Then came the moment of betrayal. His seemingly loyal squire suddenly plunged his dagger deep into his sleeping lord's breast, for it was his plan to claim the dragon slaying as his own and, with this valiant deed to his credit, win the hand of the beautiful Lady Hamby, whose love he had always coveted. I said, that's some fucked up history, and she smiled. I asked if she knew Cyril Le Sir. She said she knew him, and that he always came to the summer celebration party, which happened to be in two days' time at a dolmen in the west of the island. She said I could meet him there, we could hang out, and I could meet some of her friends. She gave me a scrap of paper with directions on how to get to the dolmen written on it. She then kissed my cheek and skipped off down the mount. This dame had just made my heart flutter. It had been a while since there had been any stirring in that muscle. A bit of a holiday romance on the cards? Why not, I thought, and descended the mount out of La Hugby to get a bus to the metropolis of St. Helier. I woke up with an even worse hangover than the morning before. I splashed some water on my face and changed into a clean shirt. I was too late for the breakfast. It must have been midday by the time I left the hotel. I had been looking at a map of the island the night before and had seen a place called the Devil's Hole. Something in me told me this is where I would find Cyril. I took a bus and daydreamed all the way there. The bus dropped me off at a very nice car park that housed some granite buildings. I noted one was a pub. I would check it out later. I wandered through the car park to a path and followed it. Everything was normal until I was stopped in my tracks by a giant metal statue of the Devil himself. All horns and hooves stood in the middle of a murky green pond. This was a vision of nightmares themselves. I couldn't work out if this was a statue in praise of Lucifer or not. It was unclear. Jersey was the sort of place where a giant statue of Satan made sense. He seemed at home here watching over his flock. I left the statue and came to a wooden shelter. I took in its atmosphere. Amongst the carvings there was some graffiti, a chalk symbol of the eye. What did it mean, I asked myself. I walked on down the path towards the cliffs. The statue was not the Devil's Hole. That was a hole in the cliffs that the sea had eroded away, which would make an unholy sound when the sea rushed in. Also, a ship's figurehead had washed up in the area, and some creative Victorian artists had got to work on converting it into Old Nick, the Horn Man. There was a locked bunker, and on the wall was the symbol again. I connected with it.
I lit up a smoke and looked out to the sea. I did not like the sea. I found it oppressive and I felt trapped by it. Give me the city any day, I thought. I went to check out the pub and spent the rest of the day and night interviewing the locals. I awoke and opened my eyes. It took a while for my brain to engage with them. I had almost rendered myself brain damaged from yesterday's session. I sat up and was met with a head rush. Without bothering to shave, I splashed some water on my face, followed by some old spice. I got dressed and made my way out to the bus station. I had to ask directions as to how to get to the doorman. It was quite a walk from where the bus was going to drop me, so I nipped to a shop and bought a small bottle of whiskey before getting on the bus. After being dropped off, I followed Georgina's directions, walking down small country lanes, swigging from my bottle as I went. After climbing over a wall to get into the field, I see a large number of people, all dressed in white, gathered around a walled-in dormer. There was a musician playing some sort of dirge. It was odd, to say the least. I spotted Georgina, so I made my way over to her to say hello. She was very standoffish, hardly giving me the time of day. What's up with you today? I asked her. Why are you ignoring me? You were all sweetness and light last time I saw you. She replied, oh, don't you see? I'm in the zone. It's the cult of the told summer magic day. Come on, lighten up and feel the vibes. Just then, a high priest appeared and began to deliver some kind of sermon. Brothers and sisters of the Fellowship of Golden Light of the Toad, we are gathered here today to give thanks and praise to our divine deity, the Great Toad, guardian and protector of this sacred site and this isle. Praise be to the Great Toad, bringer of light, banisher of darkness, toad of truth, toad of beauty. I leant on the wall and had a smoke. Then one of the pagan types came up to me and catched a cigarette. I asked him if he knew Cyril. He said he did and informed me that he was usually at the summer celebration. He didn't appear to know anything else and was vague about what he looked like. He said he was a tall fellow. 
I quizzed this chap about La Herge. He seemed to know him well. And also, his son, who was apparently a sofa. He told me that there was a big bash at the La Herge household in a few days' time, and gave me directions as to how to get there. I thanked him and decided to cut a swift dash from this gathering. I walked down the field towards the broad, open, five-mile road bay. I only had one thing to say to sum up what I had just been witness to. Fucking hippies. I awoke with an epic hangover, then found myself in St. Helier looking for the cure. I passed the telephone box. It began to ring. I couldn't resist, so I answered it. There was an old male voice on the other end of the line and he delivered this message to me. Go west to Petitport and find the path that leads to La Poulante. The man you seek can be found in this location. Proceed with extreme caution. No one likes a tourist. Good luck, my brave boy. Then the phone went dead and I put down the receiver. I was suddenly sober and hyper aware. I did not question the phone call. I made haste and went to get a taxi to my location. I found a taxi at the rank and gave my location to the driver. For the whole journey I sat in a meditative state, the calm before the shitstorm of the anticipated meeting with Cyril. The taxi dropped me on the slipway of Pettiport Bay. The driver had pointed out how to get to the path. Once on the path, I was sure that I would find him. I was certain this was the day, this was the hour, this was the half hour that my mission would change. Suddenly I was playing out what I would say to Cyril. I couldn't concentrate. I walked on around the twisting path and in front of me was a German bunker. I stopped and had a look at it. It was brutal and foreboding, out of place in this beautiful landscape. Just the sort of place I could imagine housed Cyril's crazed mind. I knew I was getting close to him. I could feel his vibes, his spirit. He was around here somewhere. His very essence hung in the air. I was moving a dial on a psychic radio and the signal was getting stronger. A faint murmur of a foreign station and some Europop fade in and out of my mind. I was starting to feel overwhelmed. There was a taste in my mouth that took me back to a shadowy place in my distant past. That taste was fear, an old friend of mine who had come to visit me again. Cyril was beckoning me to him. He was fucking with my amygdala. I was scared. This was primal fear, passed down into my psyche from my tribal forefathers. I breathed in. It was time to man up and face the beast. This had to be the place he was residing. I entered and it was odd. My psychic radio waves were picking up spirits of acid dance tracks and the feeling of free abandon, something I didn't pick up much on this island. Mind your head, read a spray painted sign. Perhaps just a statement to partiers of decades past. I slowly moved further inside. There was the detritus left from past revelers, graffiti and signs of anarchy. There was someone or something in one of the smaller rooms. I braced myself and stepped into that room. What do you want with me? he asked. Are you Cyril Le Sir? I said. Who wants to know, he said. I'm Cormac O'Connell, a private investigator from London, searching for some missing codes at the bequest of one dotty Vibert, I told him. So the mad old cow has hired a Seamus to do her dirty work. Cyril Le Sir is dead. I'm him only in name now. 
He died the day Le Serve Viber Le Herge ceased trading. Since then, I've lived in limbo. A hell on earth boy, he said. I believe in hell on earth. I've been in a Weatherspoons at last orders on a Saturday night. I informed him. He then delved into an epic monologue of apocalyptic proportions. I believe in hell on earth because I live in it. A nine mile by five mile rock in the middle of the sea. The rock, the rock, the rock on which we shall all perish. An island that sold its soul to the highest bidder, lost its way, lost its identity, bent over and let the new invaders shaft it. The cycle began when the Iberians settled in this place. Then the Gauls came and enslaved them. Next the Vikings became the masters. Then the Normans, then the Nazis, then the bankers. A cycle of an enslaved race of Jersey natives. Be me not an Englishman, be me not a Frenchman, be me a proud Jersey man. Proud of what? I asked myself. Money, money, money. I was once a money man, blinded by filthy lucre, living a life of luxury in a fool's paradise. I sold my soul, bowed at the altar of capitalism. I got greedy. I got sick. I have done bad things, my boy. I've sat in boardrooms with the devil himself. I helped him clean the blood from his money, laughed at his jokes, took a drink from his cup. Come into the light, my Christ, and wash away my sins. I was blind, but now I can see. I may only have one good eye in my head, but by Christ I can see, because in the kingdom of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. I've said all I have to say. Be gone with you. And with that, I was banished from his concrete kingdom. I walked out of the bunker and back onto the path. I walked with a silence in my brain, a shell-shocked feeling, almost like the effect of a psychotropic drug, something akin to the detachment of a person from reality, like on an acid trip. Such close proximity to Cyril had left me with an osmosis of his madness. The respite to my mind would come from a pub a little way down the main road. Some drinks would take the edge off of my temporary psychosis. I awake with a hangover of epochal proportions and a psychic come down from my meeting with Mad Cyril. I have vague memories of getting a taxi back to the hotel. I find the cleanest dirty shirt I own, bypass the shower and shave and head out on my journey to St. Mary's and my showdown with La Herge. I splash out on a taxi and sip on a bottle of whiskey in order to psych myself up. If La Herge is anything like Cyril, I'll need all my psychological defenses at the ready. Cyril has left me in a strange place. He is mad, and he made me feel mad, but somewhere in that outpouring of his troubled mind yesterday, there were truths and glimpses of sanity. I get the taxi driver to drop me off just outside where the La Herge property starts. My God, his garden is bigger than some parks in London. I follow the path up the hill and enter into the garden.
There has been a party for sure, but my tip-off gave me the wrong day. Ah, well. Looks like there's a few treats left over. Waste not, want not. I begin to help myself to what's there on the table when I hear a voice call from behind me. Excuse me, can I help you? Are you looking for Ryan? He's off surfing. Great place you've got here, I say. Have we met before? He asks. Not in the flesh. I'm Cormac O'Connell. We spoke on the phone. His face then turns to rage and he begins to scream. I told you before. I don't know anything about any codes. And I don't want anything to do with that mad old witch viber. Get out. Clear off my property. Just fuck off. Inside now, O'Connell. It was my good friends at the CID department. Back to harang me. I sat dazed in the back seat and listened to Lamech. Breach of the peace, trespassing, assault, drunken disorderly, wasting police time. Take your pick, sonny boy. If we had gotten here while you were running amok in Mr. Laherge's private property, we could have thrown the book at you. So this is how it is. I would suggest you think about leaving Laherge alone and crawl back to the mainland. Otherwise, police court is your next stop. You're skating on thin ice. Stop the car, Dave. Where I was now, I had no idea. In the middle of the Jersey countryside, lost and confused. Laherge clearly had the police in his pocket. But he was the man I needed to get to. He was the one protecting his interests and the elusive codes. I needed to clear my head and get a grip of this case and of myself. I was wandering up the road wondering how long it was going to take for me to get back to civilization. When suddenly, from behind a hedge, popped Cyril. Almost scaring me half to death. He was all smiles and joyous in his nature. A stark contrast from the day before. Hello my boy, it's not your day is it? I've been watching your antics on my binoculars from a safe vantage point up a tree down the road. By Christ, you are a brave soul. You walk right in, all guns blazing and confront La Herge. You're one crazy motherfucker. I like you. You're my kind of peoples. Right then, Mon V. Let's head back to my base camp and take stock of things. You know that Laherge owns this shed and this land. He lets me keep here and he leaves tins of food for me. See that symbol? It's a code if you know how to read it. The lines on the top eyelashes are the days of the week and I will cross one out to say upon which day I will pass by here. The eyelashes on the bottom are the weeks of the month and I will cross one of those out to indicate upon which week I will be passing by. Then I put a Roman numeral in the middle of the eyeball to represent which month. I leave them all over the places I sleep rough and friends and supporters of mine leave me provisions. 
I have been actively dropped out of society for the last five years. I've been in prison. It's not so bad in the winter. I've spent another winter in a garden shed, another in a barn, another in a German tunnel, and another one on a boat. I kicked against the system at first, wrote letters to the paper about the dirty money, lobbied the states. I was just labelled a nutter. A sure way to undermine a person, question their sanity, and better still, do it in public. Control by tapping into the collective fear of insanity. This whole place is run by social control. So fuck it all, I said. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. When I woke in the golden dawn, Cyril was nowhere to be seen. I needed to speak with him about the codes. How the hell was I going to find him again? I made my way back into St. Helier and resigned myself to the day being a write-off. As of now, demobilizing my daily hangover in the pubs and bars of downtown St. Helier would take top priority. I awoke. Well, I opened my eyes. Not sure if I had slept or not. It didn't feel like I had. To quote the great John Houston, this was a hangover that only a bullet could cure. I turned over in my hotel bed, and there, laying next to me, there was a naked brunette. I looked at the hotel floor. There was a used condom, so that filled in a blank. But not how I met her. The rest of the night was buried deep in the blackout. Absolute poetry, absolute poetry. I didn't like what I saw. My memories of the night just passed were slowly coming back. I looked down on the floor. The shirt I had worn had a large stain down the front of it. Had I been in a fight? I could not recall. I closed my eyes again, and the film of the night before played out in my head. Scene one, a shot of me. Location, outside a fast food joint in downtown St. Helier, named the Burger Palace. I was staggering around, trying to take a bite of a greasy burger. Scene two, drinking from a bottle of whiskey. Location, on the street, in the company of underage street drinkers. Scene three, a montage of bars and drinks and drunken exchanges. Scene 20, close up of me dancing. Scene 35, location, hotel room, with brunette. Brunette straddling me, intense close-up of lovemaking. Run credits, end of film, back to reality, of sorts. The brunette gets changed. The room is filled with awkwardness. I hand her a business card and tell her to look me up if she's ever in London. Her glance back says it all. I reach for my hotel bottle and take a glug. I found a tarot card in my pocket. It was the Hermit card. I had no idea how it had ended up there. I had read in a guidebook that there was a place called the Hermitage at Elizabeth Castle, so I made my way there. Elizabeth Castle was the jewel in the crown of the island's fortifications. It sat in the middle of the Bay of St. Helier, accessible when the tide was up by amphibious landing craft called ducks. I bought a ticket and took the ride out. I could sense Cyril was out there. My psychic radio was picking him up. Again, it was also picking up traces of fear. I tried to override these feelings, as I knew that me and Cyril were now on good terms. But something back there in the fear factory of my amygdala was giving off warnings. I paid my entry fee to get into the castle and asked about the hermitage. I was given directions, then wandered through the courtyards and the grounds.
I came out the back of the castle, arriving at a long breakwater pier. This place seemed familiar. Had I been here in a past life? Then I remembered that it had featured in an episode of Bergerac. I tried to channel some of the confidence of Bergerac. It still hung in the air of this place. I made my way along the breakwater. Halfway down it, on the left-hand side, were some large rocks with a chapel on top of them. This was the Hermitage. So where was the Hermit? I stare at the double void of the sea and the sky. I feel trapped and claustrophobic. The sea has become my jailer. Fuck the sea. I scanned the landscape for him. He then appeared. Cyril shouted, Oi, you bugger! And there he was, perched in the alcove of a bunker. As I got closer, I could see that he was looking vexed and was not happy to see me. What do you want? What are you doing here? He said. I've come to find the codes that you have, so I can complete my mission, I said. There are no codes. If there are, I don't know them. That mad old witch is wasting your time. I don't know anything. I am not the man you are looking for. Go, Cormac, while you still have some sanity left. Get off Shutter Island. Escape from the rock. Go, my boy. This place will drag you down. I see that your mind is so brittle. Not much left for your sanity to live in. There's bad juju floating in the ether. And the static, it can untune your signal. Believe you me, Babylon is going to fall. I feel it in my bones. The money men will leave soon like rats from a sinking ship. And panic will set in. There will be trouble and pain, but then there will be a spiritual awakening and a hard rain will come and wash away the greed and the guilt. Only then will the spring of the soul shine down on this rock. Do you have any drink on you? All this talk is making me thirsty. Do you know who lived here once, many moons past? St. Helia, the man that the place across the water is named after. That fool's paradise was named after a holy fool, a mystic mentalist, a man from Belgium whose mind was full of visions. He ended up living out here on the rocks long before the castle and the chapel were here. And do you know what happened to Helia? Well, my boy, he lost his head at the hands of some Viking invaders. The patron saint of this place is a martyr to the history of the enslaved peoples. He should have stayed in Belgium. Bad juju here. Here, take this book. It will help your life and your death and your next life. You are a wise soul, Cormac. You have powers. Use them wisely. Leave this place, I beg you. I am not meant for this life much longer and soon I shall take my leave. The light of this life is fading, but my eye cannot yet see the light of the next one. Goodbye, my brave boy.
He then turned his back on me and walked away. I left him and walked back through the castle. I was shell-shocked and sad. He seemed to have given up on his life. He was a troubled soul, and I knew that I couldn't save any souls in this life, even my own, so I walked on. Last night I dreamt I was in that desert-esque environment again. This time I appear to be leaving. I awoke feeling sick. I was sick of feeling so rough each day. Sick of this island. Sick of this case. I got out of bed to be sick in the sink. Enough's enough. It's time to take my leave of this island and face facts that I have not found what I was looking for. So I take a shower and pack up my stuff, pay up and leave the hotel. I had a skin full the night before and had ended up in some backstreet bar where the only memory I had was of a Jersey man telling me, if you don't like it here, there's a boat that leaves in the morning. So I took his advice and booked myself on the next boat out of here. I felt like the fresh air of the boat trip would do me some good and give me a distance from this place. Time to think events over. I arrived at the terminus and to my surprise, I was greeted by Alan and Dave of the local CID. I was beckoned over to their car, which the two of them were leaning against. Alan began to speak. So you got some sense at last and are going back to the toilet you call home. Well done, O'Connor. And don't come back in a hurry because next time we are going to play hard ball. No more softly softly with you. I sized up to the pair, preparing to deliver what I thought of them, when Dave suddenly delivered a blow to my fragile gut, leaving me in a speechless pile on the floor. I got up and walked to the boat. This island had truly defeated me. A number of hours later, I emerged from the great wormhole onto the street. It was awash with masses of people, a sea of souls ebbing along, unaware of the great city and the power she held. I felt alive again for the first time in 10 days. I breathed in a lung full of the London air. It was grotty and dirty and polluted. I liked it that way. It was what it was. A police siren cut through the sound of the other vehicles. This was the soundtrack of the city. Beeping horns, shouts and screams from bars, and the wailing siren of the man. I was back in the heart of the city that had assimilated me and I felt good. A strange feeling was stirring up inside me. It had not visited me for a long time, and I knew now what it was. It was the feeling that I belonged here. The feeling that I was home. I felt at peace in this sprawling metropolis. It was going to take a lot of drinking to flush Jersey out of my system, and Soho was the lady that would be host for this. I made my way through Chinatown and entered Soho on Dean Street, its main artery. I knew I was back in Soho when a shout from a doorway interrupted my train of thought. A street urchin was trying to panhandle me for change. I moved on. The French house glowed like a diamond in the rough. 
I knew that after a few scotches I would be able to make sense of the whole journey, and I would do this by regaling fellow patrons of the pub with strange tales of the island of the lost souls. The habituals of the bar would be my therapist, and I would be their patient, and I would pour out the accounts of the trip, and by doing this I would be able to heal some of the psychic scars that I had picked up on my time in Jersey. Man, that took longer than I thought to purge myself of the Jersey trip. I walked into the French two nights past and seemed to have caught the unplanned, unannounced blowout of a few of Soho's premier canas. The planets must have lined up and strange cosmic drinking spirits were unleashed to guide us all to the same small room. I felt better for it mentally, but I felt physically worse off for the two day and two night solid session that did play out. I tried to start the report, but it was hard for me to get into the zone to do it. I needed distraction other than booze. I was avoiding the task, the account of my failure to find the codes. I picked up the copy of the strange book that Cyril had given me and started reading it. I skimmed through a few pages. It was heavy stuff about deities and the ultimate reality. Not the sort of book that accompanies a hangover, that's for sure. The more I flicked through the book, the more I could see Cyril had drawn things on pages or highlighted things. I then began to notice that he had circled some page numbers and highlighted them and circled a letter on each page with a number on it. It started to fall into place. This could be the code. I got a pen and started to work. After about half an hour, I had two sets of numbers and two words. They read Golden Dawn 42 and High Priest 101. I looked at them and thought this was the best I could do with the little I had been given. Had Cyril's craziness left me half crazed looking for meanings to help my own madness? One o'clock on the dot, there was a knock on the door and in walked Dottie Viber, all smiles and happiness. Mr O'Connor, how good to see you on this fine day. I trust you're well. How was your trip to Jersey? I hope it was pleasant enough. I never cared for the place myself. Strange folk. I said, well, it was an experience to say the least, and one that's going to take a while to forget. I don't think I'll be rushing back to that rock in much of a hoodie. Good, good, she said. Well, do tell me, which one of those cretins had the code? I bet it was that revolting man, Laherge. I never liked him, a born crook if I ever saw one. The Herge didn't have any knowledge of the accounts or the codes, as he kept telling you, I said, and waited for her to come back. She continued to slag him off. I never liked him. I don't believe a word he says. He's a lowlife. I don't know why my George ever got involved with a bum like him. Come, come, what's the codes Le Sir gave to you? I believe in him. He has a good head on his shoulders. Golden Dawn 42 and High Priest 101. I said, hoping that they would make sense to her. That's wonderful, my dear, just wonderful. I had the Golden Dawn 42, but not the High Priest. Oh, you are a dear. At last I can get what's mine and live a good life, a life that I was meant to live. I smiled and thought she seemed to be doing all right to me. But what did I know? I was the messenger boy. I gave her the report and she seemed happy with it and wrote me a check for the balance. Well, good luck, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you for all your help. I will be sure to recommend you to all of my friends. Goodbye, she said. She got up and left the office and left my life. Five thousand pounds. Was it worth it for all the aggravation? At least I could pay the back rent and the bills and survive to the next case. The case was now closed for Dottie, but, if my instincts were right, it was in no way closed for me. I left my office and made my way to the tube station and descended in the wormhole and rode the tube train to Battersea. Once I exited the travel portal, it was a nice day. I made my way to the Peace Pagoda. In a dream the night passed, I had a visitation from Cyril, and when I awoke, I went and looked at the writing in the back of the book. It took me a while to crack the code. The dream kept flashing into my memory. Four giant golden Buddhas, the River Thames, and the date, the 21st of June, and a clock face that read 3.30. From the dream and the codes in the back of the book, I surmised that I was to meet him today, 3.30, at the Peace Pagoda at Battersea. It was 3.15. I wanted to get there early to see if Cyril was lurking about. There was no sign of him, and half past three had passed some time ago. I was starting to think that I had read too much into the symbols in the book. I felt let down and sad. I decided to have a look at the statues of the Buddha. 
They glowed in the sunlight. I leant against the railings opposite the Peace Pagoda and lit a smoke and thought about what to do. When suddenly a dreadlocked cowboy hatted man and a dog walked over towards me. The man smiled and told me he was a friend of Cyril's and that he had given him an important document with all the details on his involvement in dirty dealings that I was to deliver to a journalist in six months' time. I asked where Cyril was. He told me that he had gotten off of Jersey and was now heading overland to China or somewhere like that. And he wished me good luck. And he walked off out of my life. I shoved the envelope down my trousers and thought about Cyril. What a man he was and how much I liked him. I knew that it was only meant to be in my life for a very short time. Some people are like that. They explode into your orbit and burn bright, then fade fast. Cyril was one of those stars. Everything happens for a reason, and somewhere down the line, it would all become clear. He had left me feeling a feeling that I had not felt for a long time. It was hard to put my finger on it, but I remember it. It used to be called having morals, and it was something that I had not felt for a very long time. I decided to walk back to the West End and drink up the city. She was the only one who understood the pain that I housed inside of myself. She was my mother, and I was her child. And like many of her adopted children, I was born far away from her, but was drawn back to rest in her bosom and let her sights and sounds intoxicate me. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has tracked out the vintage where the grapes of love are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning with his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on.